understanding the breakthrough power of kingdom stewardship. By way of introduction tonight, we're reminded that the end time church is ordained a breakthrough church. The end time church is ordained a breakthrough church. And you read the book of Psalm chapter 87 from verse 1 to 7, but we just look at verse 5 to 7 for the purpose of time. The Bible tells us there, and of Zion it shall be said, this and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. It says, the Lord shall count when he writeth up the people that this man was born there. And look at verse 7. It says, as well the singers as the players on instruments shall be there. All my springs are in thee. Who is the thee that is referring to there? He's talking about Zion. So from scriptures, the word of God makes clear to us that according to the program of God, the end time church, which includes you and I, are ordained as breakthrough entities. The church is not a collection of non-entities. The church is a congregation of breakthrough entities. Men and women of relevance. Micah chapter 4 verse 1 and 2, the Bible tells us there, it says in the last days, they are speaking of our days. It said it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow unto it. It says and many nations shall come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord and the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So the Bible makes it clear to us that the church of Christ in the last days will become an entity that represents breakthroughs. There is nothing that speaks louder than results. There is nothing that attracts attention like results. There is nothing that commands respect like results. He said the world and the nations thereof will be rushing down to Zion. What will be drawing them down to Zion? It will be the results that will be commanded. Look at the picture that is painted. He said that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains. That is, the, the, the top of human endeavor will be the foundation of divine endeavor. When you look at where man's effort can get to, the height it can ascend is the starting point of where God will be taking his people to. That means there is nothing to envy in the world. The world is designed to envy us. The Bible didn't say that Isaac envied the Philistines. He said the Philistines envied him. There is no one in the world that is what you envy. The world is designed to envy what God is making of us. And the truth is this. As an outcome of the encounters of this season, your world will envy you. Somebody believe it, say it loud, amen. I said your world will envy you. That means that Jesus is coming back for a reigning church. A church of giants. In Psalm chapter 110 beginning from verse 1. He said, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make thine enemies thine footstools. He said in verse 2, the Lord will send forth the rod of his strength. Out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. The people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. That is the picture of the end time church. It is a ruling church, a reigning church, a church in charge of affairs. That means there is no better time to be alive than now. There is no better time to be alive than now. 
God is ordaining the end time church as a church of giants. So colorful is the future of the church that the Bible calls it a colony of kings and priests. Revelation chapter 12, chapter 5, and verse 9 and 10. The Bible makes us to understand that very clearly. We are called in scriptures a colony of kings and priests. Look at what it says. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred. Every tongue, every people, every nation, there's no disadvantaged nation in the kingdom. No matter your tribe, there's no disadvantage. No matter your tongue, your language, there is no disadvantage. You don't have to change your tongue to take your place. No. He said, out of every tongue, he has redeemed us. What? And to do what? And has made us unto our God. Kings and priests. And we shall do what? We shall reign. Where? Not in heaven but on the earth. We shall reign on the earth. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 27. Look at what the word of God tells us. It says there, it says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under what? The whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. It says all of the kingdoms under heaven, as long as it's under heaven, it is for the saints of God. It is ordained for the saints of God. So the end time church is a ruling church. It's a church of giants. It's a church of stars. It's a church of breakthrough entities. Somebody is entering into that realm from tonight. If you believe it, say a loud amen. I said, if you believe it, say a loud amen. And that means that supernatural breakthrough will become the core identity of the end time church before Jesus returns. It will become the core identity. That's how you will know those who know God. By the breakthroughs they command. He said, those that know their God, they shall be strong. And they will do exploits. Daniel 11 and verse 32. Look at what God's word tells us very clearly in the book of, in the book of Ze Zephaniah chapter 3. Verse 17 down to verse 20. He said, the Lord thy God, in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Look at verse 18. I will gather them that, will are, of, that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly. Who are of thee? Of whom the reproach was a burden. Those individuals that carry the matters of God on their head. He said, behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee. And I will save her that halted. I will gather her that was driven out. God is not looking for great names to showcase. He's looking for names to make. He said, and I will give them, what? I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. Hear this and hear it very well. Those who mocked you before, they are bound to cover their mouth at the glory of God upon your life. <laughs> but look at what the Bible says next. Look at it in verse 20. At that time, somebody said, this is that time. Will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you? For I will make you what? A name and a praise among all the people of the earth. Not only will your mocker see the glory of God upon your life, but it says I will make you a name and a praise among all the people of the earth. No local championship. No. God is in the business of making global icons out of the end time sins. Global icons. Somebody who is registering among that number tonight say, I am here. That will become your experience in the name of Jesus. In fact, the influence of the people of God is expected to be so strong that the word of God tells us that the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. We are coming to the days where by reason of the results on our lives, people 
people from various languages will be catching hold of us to say we will go with you because we have heard that God is with you. Somebody believe it, say louder, amen. I said somebody believe it, say louder, amen. Somebody believe it, say the loudest, amen. That's what we're told in Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 23. It said 10 men out of all languages of the earth will take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say we will go with you because we have heard that God is with you. He didn't just say 10 men. He said 10 men out of every language of the earth. There is a dimension of God's hand that comes upon a person's life that discrimination is out of the window. Nobody looks down at you. No matter where you are. There is nothing that commands attention like results. There is nothing that nullifies discrimination like results. There is the kind of result a person commands that when people see you, they forget your color. They forget your tribe. They forget your background. They simply run after you. That's what came upon Joseph. Joseph had such a dimension of God's hand that the king forgot about the fact that Joseph was a slave. Joseph was an Israelite. If you read the book of Genesis, you will discover that the, the Egyptians disdained shepherds. In fact, the Bible tells us that shepherds were considered an abomination. Joseph was a slave. Joseph was a prisoner. And by trade, Joseph was a shepherd. That is the kind of person that should not be allowed in the community. All of those were the identifications of Joseph. But when God touched the life of Joseph, everybody forgot all about his background, forgot all about his qualification, forgot all about his prior occupation, and he was catapulted to the top. There is somebody hearing my voice tonight. The same way it happened for Joseph, it will happen for you. If you believe it, say loud, amen. What we are talking about is not just the collective experience of the church, but it's expected to be the individual experience of the believer. The end time church is packaged for breakthroughs, and that means that the end time believer is packaged for breakthroughs. Look at what is happening in this commission. There is no other way to describe it but breakthrough. It is the kind of thing that, can, that defies explanation. Where the occurrences around becomes a mystery to all. You look at it and you simply can only define it as this is God. You can't explain it any other way. How can you see, how do you, look at the things we share as testimonies. Please hear this so that we don't get too used to the things that we are hearing. It's not normal. It is not normal at all. A 50,000 seat auditorium completed in one year without any external engagement of expatriates from anywhere, it is not normal at all. The church being filled over and over and over again, it is not normal at all. The church multiplying by two within seven weeks, it is completely abnormal. The church multiplying again within another seven weeks, it is completely abnormal. 10, 5,000 churches planted in one year, there is nothing normal about it. 10,000 churches planted another year, there is nothing normal about it. Home sales multiplying by two in one year, there is nothing normal about it. You see, it's important for us to understand that the only definition that you can give to the happenings of God in this commission is this is God. There is no human explanation. It cannot be orchestrated or organized. You can only point at it and say, this is God. Those Egyptian ma mag magicians say, this is the finger of God. I make bold to say that what we are seeing is the outstretched arm of God. This is God. But I'd like you to understand something. That what we are seeing as a commission is what God has packaged for you and I as individuals. That when people look at us, they should simply say concerning you and I, this is God. This is God. No way to explain it. 
Connections cannot explain it. I heard God's servant say something very humbling. He said, people ask me, how do I know all these great people? Ask them, how do they know me? I didn't organize to meet anyone. This is God. For somebody hearing my voice tonight, by the encounter you are having upon this mountain, from this time onward, when people see your life, when they see your family, when they see your children, when they see your business, when they see your career, what they will say concerning you is this is God. You believe it? Say the loudest, amen. amen. I said what they will say concerning you is this is God. But it's important to note that every provision of the kingdom is always at the mercy of meeting specific conditions. So the question is, what is really required for a person to experience this breakthrough package that God has for us in the end time church? What is required? And it's important for us to understand that when it comes to scriptural breakthrough, the pattern required to experience it is the pathway of stewardship. Jesus said something. Luke chapter 22 verse 25 down to verse 27. He gave us an example. He said, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And yet they that exercise lordship upon them are called benefactors. Now look at verse 26. But ye shall not be so. There's a difference between the kingdom pattern and the pattern of the world. He said, but he that is greatest among you, he says, shall be as the younger. And he that is chief as he that doth serve. Verse 27. For whether is greater he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth. Is it not he that normally sits at meat that is greater? That's the pattern of the world. He said, but I am among you as he that serve it. If you look at the world, the pattern of the world is that those who rise to the top are those that are served by those in the bottom. But in the kingdom, those who rise to the top are the ones that stoop to serve. The pathway to the top in this kingdom is the pathway of stewardship. There is no way for any man to ascend to the top until he descends first in stewardship. Those who bend down to, to serve are the ones God raises up to lead until we are committed to serving. God is not committed to our shining. It is our serving that positions us for shining. What that simply means is that without stewardship, the breakthrough destiny of the believer is frustrated. This is the reason why many people get stranded in life. So many are struggling for attention. Many are struggling for position. That is the way of the world, not the way of the kingdom. The way of the kingdom is to engage in serving and then God ultimately designs your lifting. For somebody here, I see the grace for stewardship coming afresh upon us in the name of Jesus. But what kind of stewardship positions us for breakthroughs? And we'll be looking at this all through this month. And tonight we're going to look at the fact that sacrificial stewardship is what makes us sacrificial stewardship. Psalm 50 verse 5, gather my sins together. All of them that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, gather them. The ones who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Now what is sacrifice? Sacrifice is going the extra mile. I'm paying the utmost price in our stewardship to access the topmost top. It is going the extra mile. I'm paying the utmost price 
in our stewardship to access the topmost top. Going the extra mile. Paying the utmost price in our stewardship to access the topmost top. Only those who are willing to go the extra mile are capable of attaining extraordinary heights. It takes one going that extra mile for anyone to gain or attain extraordinary heights. This Romans 28 and verse 1, it said, If you hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God and observe to do all, nothing left out, that's the extra mile. All that I command thee, the Lord your God will set you on high above all nations of the earth. So it is the extra mile that gives, gives you access to extraordinary heights. Going the extra mile. It's also important to know that only those who are willing to pay the utmost price are candidates to win the ultimate prize. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and verse 14, look at what the Bible tells us there. It says to us there, it says that, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. What is it? Forgetting the things that are behind and reaching forth to the things that are before I press, I press towards the mark of the, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So the prize is not for everyone. The prize is for those who will press. The prize is for those who will press. Those who are willing to pay the utmost prize are the ones who will get the ultimate prize. I see grace coming upon us for this in the name of Jesus Christ. That's why God's servant and Father has always said that there is no star without a scar. And the scar of every star is sacrifice. There is no star without a scar. Every star has a scar. And the scar of every star is the scar of sacrifice. The scar of sacrifice. So there is a demand on you and I to stretch in order to soar. Luke chapter 12, verse 49 and 50. Jesus said, I have a baptism to baptize with. And what would I like if it already be kindled? He said, however, he says that I have a baptism to be baptized with and how am I straightened or stretched until it is accomplished? It is those who stretch that soar. It is those who stretch that soar. So there is a demand upon you and I to ensure that we stretch in sacrifice. Now, what are some of the breakthrough virtues in sacrificial stewardship? Two things I'd like us to see tonight before we pray. Number one is sacrificial investment of our time, energy, and resources in promoting God's kingdom procures for us supernatural favor. So one of the things that it attracts is supernatural favor. Supernatural favor. And here it is. Favor is a game changer. When God's favor comes upon the life of a person, it rewrites that person's story dramatically. Psalm chapter 102 verse 13 down to verse 15. Thou will arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her. Yea, the set time is come. He said, for her servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. As a result of that, he said, so the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth will begin to fear her glory. It is a game changer. It is a game changer. It is a game changer. Favor can be described as God in the race. It is, it, is, it is where God steps in on your behalf. I see favor coming upon somebody's life uniquely in the name of Jesus. Now, favor places the attention of the most obscure destiny. It places attention of the most on, the, sorry, on the most obscure destiny, thereby catapulting them to the limelight. I put it this way. Favor is God's spotlight on a man. It is God's spotlight on a man. 
When a person is favored, it will look as if nobody else is existing. It is God's spotlight. If you have been to where, you know, the act plays, they usually have a spotlight. Sometimes the entire stage will be darkened and then the spotlight will be put on one person. There are many people on the stage, but only one is permitted to be seen. The one upon whom the spotlight is. That's what favor is. When the spotlight came on Joseph, nobody else could be seen. When it came on Daniel, nobody else could be seen. When it came on Esther, nobody else could be seen. It is God's spotlight on the life of a man. The life of a woman. That's favor. That's why the Bible said concerning Daniel, it said he was preferred. Favor puts the spotlight of God upon the life of an individual. It makes that individual become the entity of relevance. But it's important to understand that favor is not free. It is the product of our engagement in active and passionate stewardship. Sacrificial stewardship. Shout hallelujah. It's not free. When you see a favored man, favor is also not fair. Because when it lands upon a man, nobody else looks like they can be seen. They keep asking of that man. His name keeps ringing continuously. Why? The spotlight of God has rested upon him. I looked at the story of David and something caught my attention. David was an obscure destiny. Even his family, nobody remembered him. But somehow, inside the wilderness, the spotlight of God came on him. And the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 18, David that could not be remembered by his family, look at what the Bible says. A discussion was happening in the palace. And they required a man to be brought to the palace. And then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse. Whose son is he? Jesse. Jesse, who is the father of David, did not see David. When they were looking for a king to anoint, he couldn't see him. This is the same chapter, chapter 16. But here comes a man inside the palace. I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in plain, a mighty, valiant man, a man of war. He has not been to the war from before yet. He says, and a man that is prudent in matters, a comely person, and the Lord is with him. You see, when the spotlight of God comes upon the life of a man, the description changes. The descri that is what you call favor. And that favor answers to you and I through our sacrificial service. I'd like us to understand this evening that this thing that we are referring to called favor is an ultimate game changer. I pray tonight that that favor will come upon somebody tonight. Yeah. But remember, there's a condition to meet. You don't wish for favor, you walk to favor. You walk in serving God to favor. Number two thing that we discover is that the grace that makes great flows through the altar of sacrifice. It is our commitment in sacrificial stewardship that gives us access to the grace that makes great. You know, the Macedonian church in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Bible tells us that they had a particular grace that was upon them. That grace put, put them in the place effort could not take them. Grace, grace. Grace is the maker of destiny. Paul said, I'm what I am by the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. It is the maker of destiny. When you see destiny scaling heights, flying high, it's usually a product of grace. God's servant said that a meeting was being held in the early days of this commission and there was 3,000 naira needed to pay the church rent. And he said, he said, look, brethren, <laughs> speaking to some of the Leaders, he said, you're just about six in that meeting. He said, God knows if I had this thing, if I had this money, you'll not need to appeal to me to give it. He said, but a time is coming 
when some of us will begin to swine in the sky. And some others will be saying, we don't even know what they are using. He said, let me tell you what I am using. I am sold out to God. Say me, sacrifice. I am sold out to God. I am sold out to God. I am sold out to God. It is that being sold out then that is resulting in swearing high now. So the grace that makes great, it is contacted through sacrificial stewardship. Sacrificial stewardship. Shout hallelujah. I said shout hallelujah. But it's important to understand that our sacrificial stewardship delivers maximally through love. That is the difference maker in our sacrificial stewardship. It delivers maximally through love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 to 3, among other things, even if I give my body to be burned and I have not charity, it profited me nothing. So it is love behind our sacrifice that makes the difference. What does that mean? It means that before God is interested in your motion, is interested in your motive, are you in love with him? What is the motivation for your action? The motive of love is what attracts the attention of God. So we must keep going in love as far as our sacrifice is concerned. Shout hallelujah. We must have that continuously behind our hearts. Not serving God as if it's a negotiation of trade by butter. No. We are serving him with the motive of love consciously invested in God. And I tell you when that becomes the case, your sacrifice begins to procure favor and procure grace that builds up destiny. I see that becoming our experience in the name of Jesus. Two examples of sacrifice made destinies in scriptures. Sacrifice made destinies. Giants that rose by sacrifice. One is Abraham. Abraham was referred to as a friend of God. And sacrifice brought him under a sworn blessing that imparted on generations after him. We are still seeing it now. The effect of that sacrifice is still speaking here now. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 all the way down to verse 18. But verse 16 down to verse 18, we see God swearing a blessing in reaction to Abraham's sacrifice. Sacrifice took him to a realm of sworn blessings. Abraham was enjoying blessings before, but sacrifice took him to the point of a sworn blessing. That blessing is still speaking till today. Everywhere you see the Jews... You see the blessing of Abraham in manifestation. And even wherever you see believers today, what we are enjoying also is the blessing of Abraham. How did that blessing come? By sacrifice. If God is no respecter of persons and he gave Abraham such generational blessings by sacrifice, then you and I can be sure that if we serve him sacrificially also, we will get the same. That will be our experience in Jesus' name. Number two example is the example of Solomon. Solomon's sacrifice brought him into greatness. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 3 down to verse 13. He offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and God smelt a sweet silver and came down and said, what do you want? And because of the sacrifice of Solomon, he was catapulted into unusual greatness. I see that becoming somebody's experience in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we conclude tonight, let's take note of this. Remember, we are not wasting our time serving the Lord. We are investing into our generations after us. What we are doing now will not only speak now. It will speak for generations after us. Shout hallelujah. We are investing in generations after us. In the book of Psalm 112, verse 1 to 3, blesses the man that fears the Lord, that delights greatly in his, in his commandments. He sees shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Take note of this. God is not looking for who to punish. He's looking for who to furnish with his favor. He's not looking for who to punish. Every instruction from God is not to the advantage of God, it's to the advantage of man. He's not looking for who to punish, but who to furnish with his favor. Tonight, as you and I re-register our commitment to serving God, I see each one of us being decorated unusually 
in the name of Jesus Christ. Lift your hand to heaven and give thanks to God tonight for his word that we have received. Father, thank you for your word that has come our way. We give you thanks and we give you the praise.